Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, thanks for coming uh, to this session at the end of the day. My name is uh, Paul Gus Marino, and I'm a program manager on the Windows UX platform team and work a lot on the Fluent Design System and the UX platform. Uh, just to give me a sense of who's here, how many people in the audience are building apps with Windows 10 XAML, you know, UWP apps? All right, excellent, welcome. Uh, today's talk focuses on the new technologies, new advancements, new features that are coming uh, to UWP XAML, Windows 10 XAML. And as Kevin talked about in the keynote this morning, that's really applicable to all Windows developers, even if you have WPF apps, WinForms apps, MFC apps. Anyone here have MFC apps still? Yeah, back in the audience there, yep. Uh, it's applicable to all, all Windows apps now uh, with the XAML Islands technology. So hopefully this talk has stuff of interest for everyone. I got started, my first programming language that I ever used was AppleSoft Basic on an Apple II, which was actually a dialect variation of Microsoft Basic. Uh, and so Microsoft has a long history of having many dialects of the same languages. Um, and over the years, like many of you, I'm sure you've seen things in software development technologies come and, and transform. You've seen UX changes come and go. And I think today you'll see some old things that are finally in UWP XAML that you're like, finally Microsoft. And hopefully you'll also see some new things that uh, give you new ideas and new opportunities to, to advance stuff for, for your customers and, and, and your business and what you do with the platform. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a little bit of recap of the big picture, what we're doing with Fluent Design and the UX platform. And then most of the talk today is going to be a lap around what's new. There's a lot of stuff I'm going to cover about the UX fundamentals and how we're advancing the platform. Uh, in kind of the fundamental ways with density and depth and motion color and interaction changes. I'm going to cover a lot of the new controls and patterns and improvements we're doing there to help you easily uh, put together apps that look and feel and work great for customers. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some developer productivity improvements uh, that we're making as well. Uh, and then at the end, we'll kind of wrap up and I'll have some Q&A. So let's get started with the big picture, uh, Fluent Design and Windows UX Platform. Uh, if we kind of step back for a moment, you're sitting there at your Visual Studio and ready to create your app, main page, .xaml, and insert good UX here. Uh, creating good user experience is hard. It's uh, at the intersection of art and science, and you have to solve tough technical questions. How do I connect these different data sources in an efficient way that's performant? How do I uh, perform these operations in a way that doesn't block the UI thread and is responsive? And at the same time, you have to handle nuanced experiential questions, like how does this make people feel? Do they like it? Is it usable? Does it let them get the job done well? And uh, it's especially hard if you're trying to create powerful, functional applications that have lots and lots and lots of features for users. And uh, we can all laugh at this picture, but this was the state of the art of UI design in the year 2000. Um, and Things have evolved, and they continue to evolve since then. User expectations change. Um, new devices change. Sasha's talked about the world of multi-device and multi-sense computing, uh, where people have new ways they're expecting to use their computers. And so you know, what we try to do with the platform and with the design system is help give you a great path forward to have those cutting edge new design trends, those new capabilities, those new patterns that meet user expectations as the world moves forward. Um, in this multi-sense and multi-device world. Um, and for us, how we're trying to approach that is we're trying to really give you a comprehensive solution uh, as experienced creators. We hear a lot of feedback from people that you don't just want pieces that you have to put together, but you want an overall solution with not just a great platform, but guidelines and samples and tool support. And so we've been working to, to beef that up for you and to give you a really comprehensive solution to creating user experiences with the Fluent Design System and, and the work we do in the Windows UX platform. And I hope some of that comes across today. Because uh, that's really what we're trying to do with Fluent and with the platform, is give you that comprehensive solution to empower you to create the best experiences for your customers. Uh, so let's dive into some of the things that are, that are new. And uh, I'll start with a little uh, demo of the two apps I'm going to use to uh, showcase a bunch of the new features today. And uh, let's switch over to that computer. All right. And let's switch. Oh, here, here we are. Uh, how many are you, of you are familiar with the XAML control gallery? 
Have people seen that? Okay, good number of you. So this is a pre-release version of the next set of updates coming to the XAML control gallery. As you know, we put this out uh, last release. Uh, uh, last year, and we've kind of continued to invest in it. So there's now over 75 samples uh, covering you know, a whole range of the features and topics uh, in the platform. This uh, app is entirely open source. It's up on GitHub, so you can see all the source code of it and all the samples. And each of the samples even explains a bunch of different uh, use cases and scenarios. So here's the tree view sample, for example, and it covers you know, how to have a simple tree view with drag and drop in it. Uh, it you know, shows you the code of how to do that, how to enable multi-selection, how to do data binding, how to do custom templating, et cetera. So all the samples in this app really cover a lot of use cases as well. And so in all, there's you know, hundreds of samples here that you can really use. Uh, and I'm going to use this pre-release version to show you some of the new features, because our, our team builds this as part of building, building the platform out. And so these will be things will be available for you, you know, later this year, some, some of these uh, things. And some of the things are already out in the version we just shipped. So this is one app I'm going to show you. But creating great UX isn't just about the individual pieces, but how they all come together. And so we've also put together a great new end-to-end -end sample app for you. Uh, and it's a smart lighting app. So how many people saw the BuildCast app? Are familiar with the BuildCast app? Some of you. So that was an end-to-end -end sample we made last year. Uh, that showed how you can put the pieces together to create a great fluent experience. And so this is, we thought, hey, you know what? Let's give people yet another one they can use. And so this is a, a smart light app. Uh, it's about managing the lights in your home. So you can um, you know, click on different lights. Um, you can select all the lights in a, in a room, like your living room, and you can customize their light settings. I can go to party mode, to sleep mode, um, and uh, turn, you know, turn lights on and off, et cetera. You can also manage individual lights. So if I have this uh, floor device C, maybe I decide I want to rename that. I can right click and there's a you know, rename command, so I can go call it something else. Um, alternatively, you know, a lot of people have touch screens or have trackpads, uh, and so using a trackpad gesture or the touch screen, you can swipe to get to those same exact commands like rename and remove. Um, so it kind of lets you manage the lights in your home. And the app also shows a shopping kind of experience. So if I use this navigation view at the top, and one of the things I'll be talking about is the navigation view improvements, I can switch to the shopping screen of the app. You'll see there's lots of nice motion in, in the app, and that's one of the things we'll also talk about. I can go and I can create some new app, lamp. I can have fun you know, customizing it. Maybe we'll do this space or this space. I don't know what looks good. There you go. And I can go in and buy the app uh, lamp as well. So it's just a, a sample app that we'll be using today that shows a bunch of the new features and how you can put them together. Uh, and this will also be available uh, as an open source uh, sample for you later. So uh, let's head back to starting to dive into uh, whoops. some of the new things we've got. All right, so let's talk about UX fundamentals. How many of you have heard about density changes happening? Because it's been talked about a bit. Uh, how many of you think UWP UI is the perfect density today and we shouldn't change anything? OK, well, you'll be happy because indeed, oh. Well, I think you'll find that we're finding a good, happy kind of medium of how we approach density. Um, so you know, there's the old uh, density sizes we've had for a while uh, in UWP since Windows 8 days, pretty much, the kind of called the quote unquote metro sizing. Uh, so this is the new fluent standard size. So the new default in the platform, if you just go create new projects, if you have your projects target the latest OS release, will have this new tighter sizing by default. It works great with touch, mouse, pen. It's actually what we've been using and developing through our own experiences to figure out the right sweet spot sizing for people. And so if you've used apps like Edge, if you use apps like OneNote, you're actually already starting to experience this new sizing. And now we're standardizing that across the system. Um, you'll see things like the toolbars are 20% tighter. Um, there's uh, tight, more tightness in margins of headers. Uh, for forms, and things like tree views and list views can fit 40% more items. Again, they still work great with touch, especially because list views and tree views tend to have enough width to them. Uh, but it's a new kind of tighter, you know, better default. But beyond that, we really want to give you control over the right density for your app to have. Uh, and so we've refactored all the control templates to pull all the hard-coded values out of them and make them accessible as resources. And we're actually shipping a compact sizing resource dictionary that you can just apply to get even tighter sizing in a single line of code. So if you have that 
super big form with tons and tons of things in it, for example, and you don't want the user to have to scroll, you can just do compact sizing to have that all fit. And with compact sizing, even text boxes are, are tighter, um, and other form controls, lists and trees fit even more items, and so forth. And so I think a good way to see that is just as a quick little demo. And so this form here in the app uh, that I actually just showed you, this is using the new default sizing. So you can see the new default sizing fits plenty of information. Actually, the whole app by default is using the new default sizing, the nav view, that palette on the right-hand side, the forms, et cetera. You can see it's very comfortable. You may have noticed I was using touch to, to go use it, and it was very comfortable to use, worked great with touch, no problem whatsoever. Um, and uh, if I want, as well as with mouse and keyboard. But this form here is, is pretty good. But maybe you have a form that has a lot more data. So in this app, we actually have an advanced buy mode with shift click on buy. Uh, and this uh, form here is using the compact sizing. So you can see it still has a nice kind of amount of white space, a nice visual hierarchy and layout to it. Uh, but you can get even more data in there. And I can still go and you know, easily you know, reach to tap into fields and, and change values and so forth. So that's, uh, you know, compact size versus the default size. Uh, to take advantage of them, to get the new default sizing, just set your max tested version to the latest SDK. So this will be an insider flight soon. Uh, now, if your app does target multiple versions of the OS, you might have to be careful about that, right? If default sizes are changing of things, there'll be some layout changes. So you should either consider robustifying your app to that uh, by using adaptive uh, layouts or conditional markup. Uh, or another option is uh, this morning we also announced the Windows UI library. And one of the things the Windows UI library gives you, in addition to a bunch of controls, it also gives you the styles for all the controls, including the new default sizing. And so if you have an app that targets multiple versions, you can just use WinUI to get that new default sizing, and you'll have it on all the different versions that, that you're targeting. All right. So that's how you get the default sizing. To use the compact sizing, it's just a, a, a static resource, and you can just merge it in to your resource dictionary to take advantage of it, kind of one line there. Um, and if you want to do different sizing, you can you know, start with that UWP compact size resource dictionary and change the values to your heart's content to get exactly the right density for your app. So that's how we're kind of improving density with the platform. We think uh, it should really help you have really great, powerful apps that feel natural and great on the desktop and also scale to all the different other form factors, still work with touch, pen, uh, and so forth in a nice way. Uh, the next topic is, I want to talk about is depth. If you think about density as how you can take advantage of XY space, depth is all about using Z space uh, and you know, leveraging it to layer your UI. And a lot of developers tell us they're interested in doing this to help them have better layering to their UI, better information hierarchy, and focus uh, on their UI. And uh, we're making that uh, easy for you to do uh, with Z translation and theme shadows in the platform. Um, wow, this projector is having fun. But um, as you can see uh, from the slide, uh, as you move things closer in Z, they get a bigger and bigger shadow. That's how things work uh, with uh, Z depth. Uh, and taking advantage of that in XAML is pretty easy. Uh, you just set a theme shadow on. Uh, uh, as the shadow on your, on your UI element. Uh, there you go. And uh, you just change the translation of it in Z, and then you'll get that shadow. All right, So you can take advantage of this very easily now in the platform uh, in a very kind of natural way. We're actually updating all the controls, especially all the pop-up based controls, to use depth by default. So they'll all be having that Z translation set and those smart shadows set on them. Uh, one of the things that you can notice that's kind of nice is cascading you know, menus, the, the, high, the higher the level of cascade, the higher the level of depth. And so you'll see those shadows cast bigger shadows, they cast shadows on other elements. There's actually a real uh, rich model that's going on under the covers here. And so while it was just you know, a couple lines of code for you, there's actual global lighting model, there's projected shadows that are going on, there's a lot of stuff that's going on under the covers to actually create this rich, immersive shadowing system and depth system. Um, but you can just get it for free just using the, just using the controls um, and, uh, and many others. Related to the depth changes, we're making some updates in how we use the acrylic material to give it a little bit more semantic meaning. Now that there's depth for layering, uh, we're going to be using acrylic in the built-in controls more to indicate things are light dismiss or transient UI. All right? So you'll see things like 
menus will have acrylic material on them, but things like a dialog won't. They both have depth and shadow, but the ones that are light to smiths, there's an extra little semantic clue for you that they're light to smiths. You can click to make them go away because they're acrylic, all right? So that is what's going on with depth. Uh, so now I want to talk about motion. Uh, how many people use motion in your apps, have used animation? Some, how many of you have used stuff at the visual layer, like composition APIs? in addition to like XAML storyboard APIs. So a few of you have some, some experience with that. Um, here's, a, here's a few kind of improvements we're doing around motion. First, uh, connected animations are now more natural and flexible. And so if you've used connected animations, you know they help you do transitions from one screen to another screen in a very seamless way for the user that preserves context, because the same element that you saw on one screen kind of seamlessly morphs into the next screen. You'll see that by default those are now more natural, so there's this kind of swoosh animation, we call it gravity, that plays by default. <coughs> and you have more control to customize uh, the animation. And so you can have a different animation for playing back versus playing forward, for example. There's one called direct, which we recommend for backwards navigation. But we're also supporting a lot more types of animations on UI elements. Um, for a long time, you've been able to do time-based animations in XAML. Think of linear animations, ease in, ease out. Uh, that's what you've been able to do with storyboards for a long time. Now, directly on UI elements, uh, in this coming release, you'll be able to do natural motion animations. Things like spring with dampening, where there's physical forces that you're modeling and specifying that control the animation. And you'll also be able to do expression animations. These are animations where the motion of one object is relative to the motion of another. And so if one object's moving, in one direction, the other one can move in another direction. Or the opacity of one is changing, you can change the scale factor of another one. You can have different properties relate with mathematical equations. And this allows you to create much more choreographed animations. And so these are things that have been exposed to the visual layer, but now you can access them directly on UI elements without having to do a lot of extra work to figure out all the visuals uh, underlying them. Real practical examples of that, uh, here's natural motion animations on a button. Uh, so it's a spring animation, there's a damping ratio, a period of the dampening, and you can kind of see that very natural feel that you can get to the UI. It's much more physical uh, using that. Uh, expression animations, this is something we sometimes call conscious headers, but it's the idea that as you scroll, look at how that circle scale changed, the opacity of that text changed as it faded out, other elements were translated. And all of those were done in relationship to the scroll position. And so there's a mathematical function you set up once. And then as some, the user scrolled, all those other pieces moved and, and coordinated their animations with that. That's expression animation. And now you can do these all on UI elements directly. It's pretty straightforward. There's a new function called start animation on UI elements that takes a composition animation. So all those types of composition animations you can uh, plug in there. And the composition animations themselves can target these properties on UI elements. Opacity, rotation, translation scale. If you're one of the brave and the few who go and use transform matrices, you can animate those as well um, to do really fancy stuff. So uh, more animations on UI elements. We're also supporting something called implicit animations in XAML. And implicit animations are kind of like set it and forget it. You know the set it and forget it guy? No one knows that. Um, there are animations you can set and then forget. And it really makes it much easier to have motion built into your application all over the place. And, and a good example uh, to understand that is uh, changing a property on something. So let's say I have a, a calendar. And I want to rotate it. For some reason, I want to rotate it. Today, if I set rotation 45, it just instantly rotates it. You know, I call that function, and bam, it's instantly rotated. So not rotated, rotated. If I'd set an implicit animation on it, and I'd said, hey, Whenever rotation happens, I want you to, that, to do that with a smooth animation instead. Uh, then this is what you get instead. So you have that calendar. You call my calendar rotation 45, but it'll actually be animated for you. And so hooking up implicit animations makes it much easier to get motion into your app. You don't have to think about timing, coordinating all the animations you want to play. You're just changing properties on things. And because you've set up these implicit animations, they automatically get triggered and run on your behalf. And a, and a real world example of that uh, is in that app I showed you earlier when that pane was coming in and out. All the developer had to do was just set the translation so it'd be on screen or off screen, on screen or off screen. And the system took care of making sure to have it 
animate in and out automatically, uh, and it looked much nicer than this little weird video capture I got. But I'll show it to you again. So to set up an implicit animation, it's really simple. In uh, markup, you just set the trigger. So let's say I want to make sure whenever this grid, my grid, has a translation property change, that's a trigger I'm setting up. Uh, and then you specify the, configure the animation you want to have run then. So I just want to have that uh, animation take 0.5 seconds, all right? And you can animate, the, you can set up triggers and implicit animations for these kinds of properties. And in the docs and in the samples, you're able to see all the different configuration parameters you can do to control that animation and set it up uh, in a really nice way. But I think implicit animations will help you much more easily take advantage of motion in your, in your apps and make it just an inherent part of, of your experience. Uh, and uh, I will do a quick demo of animations. All right. All right, let me just use the gallery sample. We've actually added a whole animation section to the gallery. And I'm going to show just a couple of these. So this was that demo I was showing before in the video. Uh, but you can kind of have a lot of fun with it by changing the damping ratio. You go, whoa. And it's very you know, responsive. It'll pick up and stop and start the animation in, in you know, midstream of wherever you had it and, and reset it. So that's that. Here's a, here's a fun little expression animation set up. Like, oh, when this one gets big, the other one gets small. And so they just, they just have their scales uh, you know, set up to coordinate. So uh, that's a couple of the motion animation uh, samples. Uh, here's just some more of the connected animations. Uh, in there. So you should go check this out, and you can kind of see the, the code and, and all the ways to take fully advantage of it. But that's motion. All right, so we've got better density uh, to address a lot of the things people have asked for there, support for depth, a lot of improvements around motion and how you can make it natural and automatic. And now I want to talk about color. Uh, making use of colors to brand your app. One of the most common things people want to do with with their app's uh, branding is just change the color of things. Maybe your app has a brand that's red. Uh, and today, you have to go actually style a bunch of parts of controls over and over and over. You can imagine how much styling code you're writing to actually set all those color values. And some of them you can't even get to because you'd have to retemplate the whole control to even be able to access the hover, states, background, board, you know, border, or whatever. Um, and so we thought it would be helpful to give you a radically simpler way to just color your app. Um, and it's called Color Scheme Resources. Or that's the tentative name. API names are subject to change this year. Um, but um, uh, this really gives you a much simpler resource-based model for applying colors to your app. And it also supports coloring regions of your app. So you don't have to color the whole app one way. You can have different regions color different ways. And we're going to also ship a tool this year that uh, makes it really easy for you to take advantage of the color scheme resources. And I'd like to show that to you now. And hopefully you guys uh, find this useful. So this is an, an app that shows you know, all the, the controls uh, we have. These are the real you know, running, running controls, as you can see here. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you'll see just a few different colors that you can control and set. And we actually have a few different presets that we made. So I'm going to just run through those real quick. There's a pastel set. There's the forest set. And all of these kind of affect the, the full, you know, all the themes and parts and hover states and so forth of the controls. Um, there's a, a nighttime theme. All these presets are doing is changing these six color values right here. And so with color scheme resources, just changing a few different color values will apply a change systematically across all the different controls for you. Um, and you have a lot of fine grain control over it. So these are just some presets that, that we made. But I'm going to go here and pick a different color. So maybe I like kind of yellow. So I'm going to pick some yellow color for that. And you can see that kind of applied it you know, across the board to all the different controls. So you can very easily, just picking a couple colors, get a color scheme together for your app. The tool also will warn you if you're, if you're doing bad stuff from an accessibility perspective. So I'm going to try and pick a dark yellow. And at some point, it's going to tell me, oh, this color may make text hard to read. So it actually tests for contrast ratios and will warn you if you're picking color scheme that will have bad contrast ratios so that you don't do that. And then when you're done picking a good set of colors that do have good contrast ratios, you can click Export and just copy and paste this color scheme resource out of the app into your source code. And ta-da, your app has been colorized. You don't have to do all that styling you know, as you had to do. 
in the past. And another benefit of it is it doesn't mess with the high contrast styles. So you don't have to worry that your styling that you're doing is messing with high contrast styles. Um, so that's, we think, pretty exciting. Very easy to apply those. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it's even cooler because it kind of brings you some of the benefits that maybe CSS or cascading styling systems have because you can actually apply it at any level of hierarchy of the tree and it'll cascade down the values. And so typically if you have an app, you actually have not just one color scheme but a few different panes, especially in a big sophisticated app that you want to color. And uh, maybe you have a blue you know, brand, maybe you have a green and black brand. Uh, you have different panes and you want to have different color schemes for different panes and you can do that as well. So you can put color scheme resources, you can just you know, add some to your, to your theme dictionaries and you can apply them to different regions of the app and so I can have this part here have the blue and red scheme and this part here can have the gray and white scheme or, or whatever you want. Very easy to create richer, richer apps this way uh, with great branding color. So that's how we're improving color. Uh, and then finally interaction. Uh, there's a few changes and improvements coming in the interaction space. Uh, I think you're all aware of Reveal was the new interaction model we introduced last uh, release that has kind of this new visualization for hover and press states uh, on elements. We've improved that now, so it has much more visual refinement. It works great on, we had some feedback about light theme versus dark theme, and so you can see it works great on light, dark, medium tone backgrounds. Um, we've extended the set of controls it works on, so now it's there by default on calendars and app bars, and we're kind of broadening out the usage of it and refining it further. This is all, you get this for free just using the standard controls. You have this nice, beautiful, light-based reveal uh, visualization scheme. And we've also added, brought reveal to focus states, and so there's something called reveal focus, uh, which you can actively turn on, and so you just go to your application, focus visual kind equals focus visual kind dot reveal, and that'll give you this kind of glowing focus state that if you've used an Xbox, so if you bring your app to Xbox, you definitely want to use this uh, reveal style. And also if you have just a highly immersive app, maybe some apps have a 10-foot mode, maybe you're writing the front end of a, you know, of a game, the menuing system of a game, maybe you have a kid's app. For a lot of different cases, you might want to have more immersion in the focus, um, and this is a great way to do that and carry forward that, that reveal model. Um, uh, the other thing we've done is we've enhanced the element sound player support to now support spatial audio. So again, this is something that if you've brought your app to Xbox, you're already getting, you know, you're already using sound for sure. Those are those sounds you hear when you go beep, 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 and move around with your gamepad. And uh, they now support spatial audio. And so if you're running your app on Xbox, that's built in by default. Uh, and otherwise, you can choose to turn it on if you have your app run on any other device, on a Surface Hub, on a PC, on, on, on wherever else you're running it. Um, and maybe uh, that's best to do a little demo of because they are interactions after all. So let's take a quick peek at those. And one of the things we really focus on is making things as free as possible for you so you can get this richness just being on the platform because we know there's a lot of changes that are always coming. So we try to build those things in for you. So let me find, a, let's see here, let's see sounds. I'll show sounds first and then I'll show reveal. So I can turn sounds on. I can turn an spatial audio on. Now, I don't, know if we'll, I don't know if this room has like surround sound or not, so we'll see if you really get to enjoy this fully. But uh, once you have spatial sounds on, once you have sounds on, can you raise the volume a little bit? You should hear, as I move focus around, you get all those standard sounds of a menu open, focus change. You know, just like you're, you may have seen if your app is running an Xbox. I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but you can get that wherever your app is running. You can just turn it on in the platform. Um, and uh, now that I've turned these on in the app, I'm going to try something bold, which is to go to the reveal section. All right. Uh, here, we, here we are. We're having some fun. Um, and I can turn on the reveal focus visualizations. And so now, uh, you know, you can see that. and. Maybe you can hear that the sounds are coming a little bit more from this side of the screen than from that, that side of the speakers. But uh, definitely go try this at home, put on your headphones, and, and you get to enjoy it, or be in front of your TV. So anyway, that's uh, spatial sound. That's reveal focus. Um, you know, it's very customizable. And so if you, if you had you know, other colors of things you need to do, uh, you know, that's all supported as well. All right. So those are some interaction improvements. So now let's get on to controls and patterns. So those are all like, you know, core, just systemic uh, improvements. Uh, controls and patterns were really 
trying to help you more easily get high quality, complete you know, UIs into your apps. One of the places we've invested a lot is in the navigation space, how you get around your app with a navigation view control. It's one of the most popular new controls, one of the most popular new APIs you've added to the platform. Um, and it provides a really great experience. Uh, those of you who use it are aware that it supports several different display modes. So as your window resizes, it can go to a hamburger kind of minimal mode. It can go to a little sliver left compact mode. And it can go to a full expanded mode. Um, but do you know what one of the top pieces of feedback we've gotten, one of the top requests we've gotten for this control is? Can you please make it go on top? But I'm sure you get that. All right. And so now you can make it go on top. Uh, and so we've added the top, which now supports the top navigation mode. And for a lot of apps, this is really you know, what makes sense is to have navigation links along the top. Some people prefer it along the side. Now you have the flexibility. And what's great is you have a common programming model for it. Uh, with the pivot, you were able to have some links at the top before. But if you need to switch ever between pivot and left nav, you have to deal with totally different programming models. So now you have one unified programming model that integrates really well with the back navigation and other stuff that you can use, whether you want top or side navigation. It's easy to set it. There's an explicit pane display mode property. You can keep it in the auto mode if you like the auto mode that exists today and keep using that. Or you can explicitly also control all the different modes of the pane display mode. And we've made it extremely flexible uh, for you in all display modes. So there's a pane header that now supports content, not just text in it. There's a footer. There's ability to put content in the middle of the, of the pane that people sometimes want. Uh, there's search built in and settings buttons built in. Uh, it supports overflow model in both cases, scrolling in the left version, in a menu, overflow on the top. Um, and there's also a back button. So it's a very comprehensive solution for you to do navigation in your app. And we really think it should meet the, the needs of a very large set of, of app authors um, to get great high quality navigation. Uh, on the back button, one of the things I wanted to point out is that there is now a back button being drawn in the app content area. And this is related to some of the Windows sets uh, changes that have happened, where there's that kind of tab row for sets uh, that you see uh, in the shell now. As a result of that, it doesn't really make sense to put your back button up in the window caption area anymore when you're running in that tab environment, because kind of what tab is the back button controlling? And so the system is moving to people putting the back button in their own app. But we wanted to make that still be very easy for you. So instead of calling that shell API to draw the back button, you can just use a nav view, and it'll have a back button by default. Uh, and if for some reason you, NavView doesn't work for you, we're also making a uh, button style available that matches that and has the same exact sizing and so forth. So that no matter what type of app design you have, you can get a standard way to have the back button shown that's consistent across apps and laid, laid out nicely and, and consistently. Um, so that's you know, back button support. Um, so um, I think those are actually, you know, actually there's one thing I wanted to show in a demo that is not covered there which is around, oops, here we go. Oh my goodness, I'm going to turn off sounds. Or you guys are going to kill me. All right, I'll just restart it. Thankfully, we don't persist that setting. All right, uh, so here's the, the nav view. And it, you know, it has the different modes you know, we talked about before. One of the things I want, there's the top navigation mode uh, here. One of the things this app actually shows you is you can embed nav views inside your app. They don't have to just be the top level navigation of the overall app. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is if you have a tab pattern you want to have. A lot of people say, hey, Paul, how do we do tabs in our app? And the answer is navigation view is a great way to get a tab pattern in your app. And so um, you here, here I've shown that. And I can just you know, arrow, just like tabs in Win32 or wherever, you can arrow between them. It'll, it'll, it'll update the tab underneath it. And to, to get that behavior, all you have to do is you have to set selection follows focus enabled. So ordinarily, when you change focus in the, in the navigation view, it doesn't navigate there. It just moves the focus around. But if you want to have it have that behavior where it navigates just by changing focus, that's just a property set on it. And that really gives you exactly you know, the tab behavior that, that you know and, and would like. And so you can use this to get tabs in your app as well. All right. Um, Outs so this is all about navigation inside your app, but a lot of people have also navigation outside their app. So there's a couple other sessions tomorrow that you may want to attend that talk more about uh, new windowing APIs uh, for navigation you know, outside of your one app window, and also the sets talk, uh, which will talk more about that topic with the back button and kind of what you can do with sets and the control you can have to open new windows in tabs and so forth with the sets feature. All right, so that's navigation. Commanding, 
We've really been spending a lot of time thinking about commanding and how we can help you have the best commanding solution in, in your apps for users. One of the things we've found is that a lot of people want to expose commands in multiple UX surfaces in their app. For example, in that uh, lighting demo app, uh, you could right click on those lights to go and modify them. But those same commands were also exposed on little hover buttons. And they're also exposed on swipe. And users really like that. They like to be able to find commands in all the ways that are natural to them and that they expect. Uh, this app didn't have them, but you might even have a toolbar or menu bar at the top of the app with commands. You might have search in your app that has commands. Often you have the same commands exposed in lots and lots and lots of places. And while that's great for users, it can be tedious for the developer because you end up having to write the same view code over and over and over again. Like you had to write the word delete three times and refer to the delete icon three times and get the right tooltip three times and so forth. And so we really wanted to make this much more streamlined to help you create these apps that expose commands in all the places and all the ways that, that your users want you to have them. And so uh, to help you with that, we've introduced UI command. So UI command uh, bundles together all the kind of UI information around a command. Its label, its icon, its access keys, its keyboard shortcut, its tooltip string, and so forth. So you can define it once in your resources. And then every place where you want to show that command, you can just refer to it. So in your menu flyout, in a button, in a swipe item, and so on and so forth. And all the different command controls that we have on surfaces will present it in the appropriate way. And so the swipe control will show the icon with the label and so forth in the right way. The menu flyout will show it in the right way, et cetera. But you could just define it once. This really should streamline, make it a lot easier for you to manage commanding in a rich way in your application. So we're really excited about this improvement. Um, and to make it even easier for you, we're adding a standard UI command. Uh, it turns out a lot of apps reuse literally the same exact, like have the delete command, have the print command, have save, have move, have share. And why should every developer have to go and write those strings into their code and localize those strings for other languages they want to bring their app to and find the right icon for them and so forth. And so to help make that much simpler for you, we're introducing the standard UI command. It basically encapsulates, it has a library of a lot of the most common commands that we see app authors use over and over and over again. And all you have to provide then is the actual implementation of the command. And so if you're an MVVM developer, uh, you can use the standard UI command. You say kind equals delete if it's the delete one you want, for example. And then all you have to do is pass your uh, relay command to it. And that'll handle all the UI aspects of it for you. All right. Uh, alternately, you can explicitly provide the execute requested and can execute requested. So we think UI command and standard UI command will really make it a lot easier for you to expose your commands in your app in all the different surfaces you want. Speaking of surfaces, uh, we want to have some more better surfaces for you to expose your commands. And one of the ones that we're bringing uh, to the UWP, this might be one of your finally moments, is the menu bar. So yes, there's a menu bar brought into Fluent. We're a very inclusive design system, a very inclusive platform, and we want to have all the UI patterns supported that you care about. And so it's a great menu bar implementation. It has all the interactions you'd expect with arrow keys and alt keys and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it also has nice modern styling and animation, shadows with depth and acrylic and, and all that kind of stuff. So really great menu bar implementation. And of course, uh, you know, simple API to it. And of course, you can use the UI commands with it. And it also reuses menu flyouts. So if you ever have a menu flyout for a context menu in your app and you also have the menu bar, you can literally reuse that same menu flyout you know, code. So it's very, very easy uh, for you. Um, another uh, UI uh, control that we're bringing into the system is command bar flyout. And if you've ever selected text in mobile operating systems, if you've ever used Microsoft Office, you're very familiar with the idea of having a little contextual toolbar that appears around the selection proactively to let you get some commands. And so now we have a standard control for that in the platform. And it's connected into text controls for free for you. And I'd like to, uh, and it's very kind of flexible. It can have not just a little list of commands, but an expanded mode with, with a fuller set of commands, sort of subsuming what a menu flyout used to do. And I'd like to demo it for you. And one of the things I'll say about our demos is that I'm showing you the latest and greatest bits. Literally, if you look down here in the corner, I don't know if you've ever seen internal Microsoft builds, but this is literally the build from our team's branch from May 2nd. So it's like very, very fresh bits. And so there might be some bugs, because we're still developing this. But I wanted to show it to you and, and let you have kind of the first, first uh, see of, of real code working. Uh, so. 
let's see. So what was I going to do? First, I was going to go show here. Yeah, if I go to rename something, uh, if I go and select that word floor, you'll see now there's cut, copy, paste. So I don't have to press and hold with touch anymore to get to those commands and wait for a context menu to come up. Just simply selecting with touch will give me those standard text commands. So that's one common usage of this. And it's built into the text controls. The developer didn't have to do anything to get that. Um, but you can do more. Um, one of the things that this app does when you're customizing a lamp uh, is they have a fun little feature where you can do an engraving. So you can ask the lamp maker to you know, put an engraving on the, on the lamp because you're giving it as a gift. So maybe I'm going to write, Happy birthday, Sabrina, my sister. Uh, and let's say I'm giving her this lamp. And I, if I select this text here, I'll also get that command fly out okay, with mouse. And here it has even more commands in it. It has bold. It has italic. It's not just cut, copy, paste. Uh, rich text boxes, we're by default building in all those rich text commands like bold and italic into that toolbar. But you can actually take it further and extend it and put whatever you need to put in it. So if you have some medical application, you want to put medical reference commands. If you have artificial intelligence and you're taking advantage of AI services and doing text processing and have things you want to go promote to the user, you can easily use this control to, to do that. And so we think it's a great new addition to the family of commanding services uh, that we expose for you. It's built into all these controls by default. You can customize it. Uh, and use in other cases. Uh, the API to it is very familiar to anyone who's used the command bar before. There's a primary list of commands that go in the toolbar part. And then there's a secondary items list that goes in the menu part. Um, oh, I didn't show the animation, but that's all right. Uh, when you click on the little dot, 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 it'll expand and collapse. Uh, so if you select text, it might be in that minified mode, but you can click the dot, dot, dot to expand. Or you know what? I'll show it. Uh, um, here we go. Let's see if I can. Let me get this up and running. Because uh, I just want to make sure you understand this primary versus the secondary commands. Here we go. Let's go create a lamp. Here we go. All right. Oops. Uh, yeah, so uh, when on selection, it, op it, it just pops up in this kind of collapsed mode. But you can click here to expand it and get the, full, you know, the secondary list, kind of like a command bar does. Alternatively, if I right clicked, uh, it would automatically open it in that expanded state. Okay, So proactively, it'll open in the minified state, just selecting. But right clicking or pressing and holding, it'll right away open in the expanded state. So it really subsumes. The, the functionality of the context menu in that way. All right, hope that makes sense. Um, uh, you can customize the command bar on a text control if you want. There's a new selection flyout property on the text controls. And so you can use that to override the, the default command bar with a custom one with your own commands. Um, and uh, in terms of using it versus other controls, since people ask about this, um, you know, it's great for text selection on Canvas, object selection, any kind of Canvas like that where you want to proactively show commands, great control to use. If you have lists, we still recommend you follow the, the standard pattern and the practice that's there of having the context menu and the swipe and the hover buttons. Because pop-ups can kind of get in the way of navigation with keyboarding. And so you want to be thoughtful about how, you know, how you, when you use that. Uh, but to implement that context menu, you, you can use the command bar flyout if you'd like, uh, because it does subsume the, the menu flyout's capabilities. Just put all your stuff in the secondary list, for example. All right. So that's um, OK. And one last thing on commanding is we've heard a lot of requests for more types of buttons. You know, hey, if I have rich toolbars and rich commanding, there's not just simple buttons and toggle buttons, but people want drop down buttons. So that's a button that you click on, and it gives you a little drop down. You could do that today, but you didn't have the visualization that showed you the little arrow. And so users didn't know that there were more commands hiding in your app. And so now you have that. We have split button, which has clicking on the left part of it just does an action. And clicking on the right part of it gives you that menu with the other options. So you've probably seen that often in, in, in UIs, like uh, highlighting UIs. And even a toggle split button, where the left part operates as a toggle to, for example, turn on and off bullet lists and the right thing opens a fly out that let you change the type of bulleted list. All right? So we now support 
you know, all the full range of button types that, that a lot of apps would like to have um, in a nice way. So that's commanding. All right. Collections. So apps, you know, there's navigating around them, there's acting on things in them. And one of the most common things people do in apps is present a lot, you know, data, collections of data from, from databases to users. And uh, yes, we finally have a data grid for UWP available now. It's been a long standing ask. Um, and it's a, a, a really nice uh, implementation with all the features you expect the ability to edit data in line, reorder columns, resize columns. Uh, Etc. And uh, it's actually uh, the API to it is very familiar to the Silverlight Data Grid API. Uh, so if you've used that before, you'll immediately know how to use this one and be able to easily port code over to it. But the UI has been refreshed. Uh, it has touch and pen support and nice panning and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we're actually shipping it. You know, we know people really want this, you know, really badly. And so we're just shipping it right right away. It's in preview now, but we've, we've actually contributed it to the UWP, uh, to the Windows Community Toolkit. So you can just start using it right away. And it's actually open source, managed C-sharp code. So if you want to contribute to it or, or make additions, you're, you're welcome to do that, because uh, we've, we've contributed that code. Uh, so there's a data grid. Um, we also have a tree view. This is, just came out in the Windows update that just went out this past month uh, into the 1803 SDK. And not only is there tree view, but we're continuing to improve the tree view. And so uh, in this coming uh, update, you'll see there's better multi-select and drag and drop support above and beyond what's already there. And there's uh, good data binding and templating support. And I want to show you that uh, for a moment. Um, so here's how you can use the tree view with data binding. Um, you actually can, uh, in your data template, you can directly return tree view items that you want to show. And we won't wrap them. We won't mess with them. We'll just like directly insert those and show those. And so you can directly control the exact tree view item you know, presentation that you want that way. And, um, we, and if you want to have hierarchy, uh, you, you can just make, have an item source on that tree view item that kind of gives us the children. And then we'll go and, and walk those and generate those. And so it's a, we think a pretty good and simple model that allows you to, uh, to use tree view with data binding in a, in a nice way. It's a little different than people who are familiar with hierarchical data templates and some stuff that used to exist in WPF. Uh, but we think you'll find this is a, a really good model, and we welcome you know, questions and, and, and feedback and stuff on that. Um, and then finally, there's also a refresh container to let you pull to refresh, um, which works not only with touch, but also with trackpad gestures. Uh, so uh, you know, every, almost everyone has either a trackpad or a touch screen these days, on, certainly on laptops. Uh, and so it's a great addition uh, for you to have that support for that pattern. And I do want to demo a couple things about that. I already showed you the tree control earlier, but on the refresh container, one thing I just wanted to point out uh, that we've done. So here, you know, kind of using it. I can also use it with my trackpad. So I'm pointing down my trackpad, not with touch. It has a visual, you know, it has a full visualization system so that you can tell when you've crossed the thresholds to refresh, etc. And it also supports a lot of customization. So instead of the usual refresh. Glyph here, the developer did a fun little sun, and so a little sun is coming out, and then it's oh, blinks to let you know, okay, I've passed the threshold of refreshing, and then I let go, and it'll spin and refresh. All right, so it's a really nice control, has flexibility for you to customize it, um, and you should go check it out and take advantage of it if uh, it's useful to you. All right. And then finally, forms and data input in the commanding in the in the control space. We've been doing a lot of investment to help you there. Uh, one common request has been data validation, and so we now have great data validation support built into the controls. They can actually present uh, the validation errors in two ways: either an inline mode that appears below, or a compact mode that appears on the side. And it's compatible with and works with the ways you've done data validation in the past in .NET. Um, and so you'll find it's very natural and intuitive to use. And I'm going to do a very quick demo of it, but I know that there's a talk tomorrow that Ryan Demopoulos is giving on LOB app development, where they're actually going to go into a lot of depth on all the richness you can do with data validation. But I'm just going to show you one quick thing uh, with it, which is in my forms. I'm buying this lamp for my sister now. So here's the kind of validation below, the presentation of it. So it can be smart about you know, when you want to process that. If you want to handle it on submit, or if you want to handle it after keystrokes, you can kind of decide how you want to do that. That was the validation error below. Here on zip code, we showed it being on the side. 
So that's the compact mode. And if you choose the compact mode, <coughs> then on hover, you'll get a tooltip with the actual error message. So you can decide which, which style makes sense for your app, and we support, we support those styles. And if you want to even further, there's a lot of templating support for you to go wild and, and configure those even further. But that's uh, data uh, validation. Uh, we also now support headers on the side in forms. And so sometimes people want headers above, sometimes people want headers on the side. So that's inherently supported. You can kind of, depending on your layout, you can fit more fields in the same space with headers on the side sometimes, sometimes with headers on top. So you've the, you have the choice of how you want to do it. Um, also in form space, we're making combo, fixing combo boxes to open uh, larger. So you can now actually fit all 12 months at once uh, in a combo box. Blast from the past, but uh, we're happy to uh, improve that. Um, and, and you can now also edit combo boxes, uh, have editable combo boxes. And, and we've actually done a nice job of making sure they work well regardless of the input type you're using. So even if you're using pen input to do the inline handwriting um, or mouse or touch, uh, that kind of works with all those modalities. Um, and it's pretty easy and straightforward to kind of go add that to your combo box. Um, and um, but beyond, you know, some of those things were things were kind of bringing some things back that you maybe expected. One thing that's kind of pretty new that's now supported are uh, content links, uh, which lets you do app mentions. And so if you have a scenario where people maybe want to refer to other people or refer to locations in, in text areas where they start typing an at and then it kind of completes that person's name or that location name, that's now inherently supported in the platform. It plugs right into the people uh, APIs of Windows and the Maps APIs in Windows to give you all those locations. So you don't have to, you know, for you it's just a few lines of code to add that and you get that power of the platform. And I think that's one that's worth seeing in person. So I'm going to go switch over to that to let you see it. Um, I'm going to go to the sample gallery here. I'm going to go to rich edit box. And so in this sample here I can turn on people completion or places completion. I'm just going to do places so that my address book isn't up on stage. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, let's check out the, I don't know, Safego fields. Is that, oh, you know what? My demo's not going to work because I'm not on the network. So, but, uh, Believe me that you can actually uh, have completion. And rather than trying to join the network now, uh, that I see that it's down, I won't uh, show you that. But uh, it does work. But I will show you the editable combo box, just in case people don't realize what that is. It's a combo box where not only is there a preset list of options you can pick from, so like this app here has a bunch of rooms I could pick from, but if I wanted to create a different room, instead of having to not be able to do it at all, I can just type you know, greenhouse. And I've created the greenhouse spelled. All right, so that's an edible, there you go, and there's an edible combo box. Um, so that's a whole bunch of improvements uh, around kind of forms and data input. So we talked about fundamentals, we talked about controls and patterns, and now I want to let you know about some of the new things around developer productivity that we're adding to the platform. Hopefully those things I showed you already will improve your productivity, but there's a few additional investments really just focused on developer productivity specifically. Um, one of the places we've been trying to invest in is around improving binding for you. And we really want to make XBind a great uh, solution for all your binding needs and flesh out the full set of scenarios that people want uh, binding to work for. And so XBind now works in styles. So I think you guys will like that. <laughs> XBind works in control templates. And one of the things that's cool about that is now you can take the benefits of XBind uh, and use that in this context. You can now have function binding and two-way binding, for example, in control templates. Um, uh, we've also uh, support I notify property change. If you have, if you're binding to a method, you can now fire I, pro I property I notify property changes uh, uh, to have binding work for for those cases as well. Um, and um, We've also, so that eliminates the need for multi-binding and other converters. So you can just use xbind with functions to meet those needs. Um, and the last point I wanted to make was that we're going to have automatic null checks for all xbind use cases. So some of those gnarly surprise crashes will hopefully go away for you and make it a lot more usable and easy for you. Uh, also, just in terms of XAML improvements beyond the binding space, we're supporting nullable types. That's been a longstanding ask. Uh, that I know about for a lot of cases. 
And uh, we have iService providers for markup extensions. And so this will let you bring your custom markup extensions from WPF and Serverlite and, and start to bring those to UWP XAML, Windows 10 XAML, and use those. So we think you know, these improvements around markup and binding will really help you be more productive as developers, help you have the model and architecture that you want to have in your apps, um, and help you bring code forward that you've, that you've written in the past. Um, so the, the other developer productivity improvement, you know, I, I think of this way that we've done is Windows UI library. Kevin announced that this morning in the keynote. And really, it's the new way to get native UWP fluent controls and styles. Uh, it'll be a NuGet package. And uh, it's the same controls that, that we use at Microsoft, the same ones that ship in the platform. It's literally the same source code base, but packaged up and shipped to you as a NuGet package um, so that you can use it in market right away you know, as we release them on the current OSs that are in market. You don't have to wait for people to ramp up on the new OS version. Uh, it's backward compatible. At least this first version will be backward compatible to the anniversary update. And uh, you'll see that the features that are in it work uh, on that scale of OS versions. Sometimes there'll be some things that gracefully degrade, because maybe an underlying platform capability wasn't there to do a certain visual effect or a certain animation or something. And so it'll just scale back on that OS. But from a developer model perspective, as you use the API, you should find that it kind of just works for you the, the way you'd expect it to work. Um, and uh, it'll have a bunch of the new popular controls we've been adding in the you know, last year or two, the tree view, nav view, menu bar, and again, the fluent styles and, and density changes for all the controls. So that's the Windows UI library. Um, and then finally, you know, one of the things we've been working to invest in is just a lot better interoperability uh, between XAML and other technologies that you have to use, other languages, uh, and so forth. And so there are a few investments that we've been making there. Uh, one is we made a bunch of web view improvements to help you blend web content. A lot of apps have to blend web content uh, into their app. And sometimes you don't have total control over that content from that web server. And so now there's a feature that allows you to intercept and provide a response to HTTP requests for the web content. And so for example, this example from Microsoft Store, when it's running the web browser, uh, they have one set of styling. And they've decided when it's run, now my slide really doesn't show this, does it? But it does on my computer, so the contrast ratio is weird. But they have different styling on the right-hand side where there's a gray background. You'll see some of the icons have updated as well. Um, and so you can provide different styling, a different CSS file for the same exact web content to make it fit into your app's look and feel, OK? Um, and you can also run WebView out of proc uh, now. So that'll also help you in web blending kind of scenarios. Another improvement that we've made, and, and I'm not going to go into depth on it because Mike Harsh uh, went into more depth on it in his talk, but is the UWP XAML hosting, the XAML islands work. That's going into preview, and that'll allow you to start using islands of XAML content inside your existing apps uh, so that over time you can grow to have more and more, you know, eventually all your app UI, hopefully on, on modern, you know, up-to-date UI uh, technologies. But you can do that piece by piece. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, I want to talk about XAML standard. I've got a lot of questions about this. And so uh, the goal of XAML standard is to uh, improve dialect alignment between Windows 10 XAML and XAML Informs XAML. And there's a set of improvements that, that the teams have been working together to, to, to bring to you as part of that effort uh, that, I'm, that I'm happy to tell you about. And then there'll be more information about them in the XAML Informs talk tomorrow, too. Uh, one is Visual State Manager will be in XAML Informs 3.0. So that'll help you bring more alignment in the dialects there. There's a preview set of XAML standard tags things around text and buttons and, and certain panels where there are just their different names for the same concept and the same thing. And so those are going to be aligned uh, in Xamarin Forms 3.1. Um, and then XBind will be coming to Xamarin Forms later this year also. So there's, more, there's work going on to try to align these dialects. And we look forward to hearing the feedback from you of other pain points you have if you're trying to use Xamarin Forms and Windows 10 XAML so we can work to align those things better for you also. So that's an update on XAML standard. And, and we welcome you giving feedback to the teams directly, actually, to, to the Z Windows 10 XAML team and the XAML Forms team about pain points that, that you have through the standard feedback uh, channels that you use. Um, another thing we've added is something called XAML Direct. Um, unless, is anyone here author middleware libraries on top of XAML? If you do, or if you use middleware libraries, uh, you'll find this kind of helpful. It's a new set of primitive APIs meant for tools and middleware developers that 
uh, gives them a more efficient way to go create elements um, uh, when they're not really using XAML markup, but they're just kind of creating the objects directly. Uh, and so it's an improvement. You should see middleware vendors use it and might get better performance out of middleware uh, as a result of that in time. But that's XAML Direct. We're excited about that. Um, and then uh, for the C++ developers, anyone who's used C++ CX will be very happy about how much easier and better C++ WinRT is to use, and XAML fully supports that. In fact, if you go to our docs now, you'll see that you can see the C++ WinRT version of all our docs and all our reference docs. Um, so that's great. Um, so that kind of you know, wraps up the lap around all the new stuff about the fundamentals, the controls and patterns, a lot of developer productivity improvements. I hope you uh, enjoyed what you got to learn about. We've got a bunch more resources uh, that you can check out offline. Uh, our guidance and docs, which we continue to invest in. We, we personally spend a lot of time on the team trying to make these docs great for you, investing in our samples. Um, the XAML control gallery sample is available both in the App Store, just to go and play with and learn, as well as the full code of it. And the same will be true of the Van Arsdale sample, uh, which we hope to make available later this year uh, as the, with the platform update. Um, there's a bunch of other talks I recommend you go to um, the coming up uh, tomorrow. You'll, there's talks on the new windowing APIs and sets, harnessing the power of AI with ink, um, creating innovative experiences at the visual layer. So a lot of the shadow stuff I showed, and also those cool effects with the lamps where they were moving and the lighting effects were all being done in them. That's all being done in, re, in the visual layer. And so if you go to that talk tomorrow, you get to learn about that and, and the power you have to customize that. And then there's a rapidly construct LOB apps, the UDP and Visual Studio. That's really where people are gonna literally roll their sleeves up and build a whole uh, line of business app uh, on stage using UWP. It'll go into a lot more depth on data grid, data validation, and a lot of the things of interest to enterprise developers. So I really recommend you check that out. And also the theater sessions. Uh, tomorrow, uh, there's one from the office team talking about how they're starting to use Fluent Design System and the UWP platform in their apps. And so I think it's really insightful for you to go, go to that. I'll take questions at the end. Yeah. XAML Islands was talked about in the Modernizing Desktop Apps talk by Mike Harsh at 10.30 a.m. earlier today. And so you can either come to the booth to ask us about that or go check out that talk on Channel 9. It'll be posted online if you, if you weren't able to go to it. And there's also a spatial computing talk about how the, the work uh, that's going on with depth and so forth will help you if you're considering MR and holographic, you know, mixed reality future. So that's uh, our talks, and I wanted to end with one more little video for fun, and then I'll take questions. But thank you very much for staying this late on Tuesday. Well, thanks very much. Uh, and and I'll, I'll hang out here and take questions. If anyone has questions of broad appeal to everyone, you're welcome to ask at the mic now. Otherwise, I'll just hang around here and huddle around, and people can come ask me questions. So thanks. Yeah. Um, so I have a uh, few questions. Uh, first, about that shadow uh, effect that you showed, and also yeah. like the, what was it called, reveal um, focus. Yeah. Are those lighting, like, are they actual color blending? Like, w w if you have um, the yeah. shadow with um, reveal highlight, does that light interact with the shadow? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, the, both the reveal highlight, all those reveal highlight effects, the reveal focus effects, and the shadow effects with the theme shadows with the depth are all using the visual layers, uh, lighting models, and com you know, composition systems. So none of that, it's not like a PNG of like a shadow that we're like copying and pasting over. So it, it, it's a real lighting model. Um, I, you know, I, I'd have to defer to them about, you know, for efficiency and performance reasons, we sometimes are thoughtful about how we scope which lights paths cross, I'll put it that way. Uh, and so I, I don't know exactly if, how the shadow and the, and the reveal would interact, but it's all part of a common lighting model and lighting system. They're all real-time generated computer graphics effects. And so in general, they, they operate with real materiality and physics to pay in the blends and, and things that are involved there. So it's not, we're not just like pasting PNGs, you know, around. Um, but, you know, we have to dig specifically into the specific case you're thinking about to answer in, in detail. But ho hopefully that helps. And tomorrow, the talk that Danielle and Soham will give, I think, talks a little bit more about the visual layer stuff as well. Uh, my second question is about uh, WinUI. The, um, one of the problems is, um, like, sometimes it's not just the whole control that's new. It's like a, a new property on an existing control. Yes. Or do I like, remember which, like, when to check that? Yes. Uh, I think what you'll see is that when UI will have, so like this fall, or I don't know, at some point this year, I pres there'll probably be a new version of Windows, without promising any specific things. And let's call that Windows version foo, foo creators update. The, uh, <laughs> uh, there'll be, whatever the version of the controls that ships with that will ship in WinUI. And so if it has extra properties on it, it'll have extra properties on it. Um, if, that, if that makes sense. If it's one of the controls that's shipping in WinUI. Not every single control is in WinUI. So like button is not in WinUI. So the controls that are in WinUI, those will just be the latest version with the latest set of methods and properties and events and so forth. But if it's some control that's in the, not in WinUI at this point in time, then that'll still depend on the OS version. But will those like properties, um, will they have like backwards compatibility to anniversary update? That, that's the hard part. Is like it's hard to remember like this property you have to check on this OS. And yeah. So uh, what we're going to do is the controls will be fun. You know, our, our intention is that the controls are fully functional from a functionality perspective, and so like NavU having a back button or NavU having uh, ability to put content into it or having a top mode. That'll you know, NavU having ability to have a top mode that'll be in there and that'll go down level. But it might be if some control is using a certain animation or something, it might be that when you run it down level, you don't see that animation. It just does like a hard break or something like that. So in general, we're trying to keep the API the same and functional, like not have functional differences. But there might be some behavior differences based on the OS version it's running on. Um, and some of those might be policy, you know, policy changes and stuff like that that we build in. So I don't know if that, that helps. But our intention is that you can write to them and those APIs work functionally on the different OS versions, the behaviors might change a little bit to fit into that OS version's capabilities. Yeah, as long as it doesn't crash. Yeah. And, and I mean, and we internally, I'll say, part of how we develop the controls in full transparency is we, we want to make sure to give you good high quality controls. And so we don't just like code them and put them out there. We actually use them in our own apps in market. And so a lot of the first party apps from Microsoft actually have already been helping us test out controls in market using a mechanism like WinUI for us to get that data, that real data of hundreds of millions of users pounding on it so that we know they don't crash before we go and put them into the platform publicly for everyone to get. So we're already using this mechanism that we're making available to you internally. And we're kind of just trying to make that available externally as well. Yeah. And my last question is about um, the, the XBind improvements that you showed. Yeah. Um, there was something I think uh, in WPF called XStatic. So it lets you bind to like a static class or something, and hmm. I haven't found an easy way to do that with XBind. Have you considered like making static properties bindable? Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the answer is to that question, um, but I'll write it down. If you, if you come to our booth tomorrow, the XAML UI booth, I can try to make sure whoever's there will have gotten you an answer to that question. I'm not sure the answer is. Right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Um, I have a question related to the, uh, the uh, performance uh, between the, when you have a UWP uh, interrupt with uh, some other language. So currently we have a, actually we have a WPF application. So because WPF is built on top of DirectX 9, the 
performance is not great. Uh, we're, we're thinking about using the, the Zemo Island, uh, uses the uh, UWP component in WPF. So I was running the, we have any data regarding the performance here, so. Mm. That is a really good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and so I'll write that one down as well. And maybe if you come to the, to the booth tomorrow, or I don't, I don't know if there's anyone here who would know in the room right now, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the perf characteristics of it would be in hosting in a WPF app that's using DX9 under the covers. I, I would love to talk, talk to anyone on the team, so if you could hook me up. Our, our intention is to put it in preview as, as soon as we can so that people can actually start pounding on it and using it and giving us feedback about things that, that are or aren't working so well about it. Because we really want to get it stable and really good quality for you. And so rather than holding off on making it available, our intention is to put it into preview as soon as we can so people can start giving us feedback on it. Gotcha. Um, that's kind of why we're even announcing it you know, before it's all, you know, in, while it's in preview still. So, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find out, and, and if you come to the booth tomorrow. Um, when is that yeah, tomorrow? So. Uh, well, I'll try to get the information and then send it to the people who will be at the booth so that whoever's there can have an answer to that. Thank you. Um, I, I can give you my card. You can, so you can come give me your card, yeah. Um, if there are any other questions of broad interest, you think, feel free to ask them the mic. Otherwise, I'll just be hanging out here, and you can come individually ask me questions, too. Thanks.